Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for having me. I'm Sonia Vallop, and I'll be speaking to you tonight about exploring ZFPs or zinc finger proteins as a possible therapeutic strategy against prion disease. So um, up top, before I even launch into these slides, um, I want to take a step back and say some of you may be saying to yourselves, if you've followed some of the work I've done in the past, wait, I thought Sonia was working on ASOs. I thought that was a, a therapeutic strategy that we were very excited about for prion disease. And I just want to confirm that it is. Um, Eric and I remain super committed to our own partnership, really excited about it, really excited to help move ASOs into the clinic. Um, I hope what I can share with you today is um, a, a different project that is a little bit more exploratory in nature. Um, but hopefully by the end of the presentation, I'll be able to convey some sense of how it actually relates to our work on ASOs and why we think this is a valuable thing to investigate, even though it is further from being a drug today and more a, a bit more of an exploration. So with that, um, I'll, I'll quickly introduce myself um, and our sort of personal quest in prion disease. And forgive me if um, you folks have heard this before. Um, some of you may know that um, I got into prion science because I lost my mom to genetic prion disease. And then the next year I tested positive for her mutation. So for, for Eric, my husband and I, um, this was just a kind of transformative moment. Um, we gave up our old careers and we retrained in biomedicine um, to try to help contribute to doing something about prion disease. Um, so today we run our own prion lab at the Broad Institute in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, and I'll talk to you about some of what is going on there. So a little bit about how we think about prion disease in our lab. Um, you all in the community are familiar with the fact that there are a lot of different subtypes, different names in the prion disease world. Um, prion disease can come about in different ways. Certainly, as we exchange stories, these cases um, can present in different ways. We hear about different symptoms. But in the lab, I think we are really guided by the fact that at its heart, prion disease has this sort of unified story. We have this, this one gene, the prion protein gene, that gives rise to one RNA. So the gene is sort of instructions for making this messenger RNA, which in turn is instructions for making normal prion protein. And you folks have, have seen this um, many times in the past, the idea that we have this normal prion protein that's not a problem, but it's capable of misfolding into this bad red prion that um, can cause all sorts of trouble. So our focus, as we've thought about how to tackle prion disease, has really been on reducing the amount of prion protein in the brain in the first place. And specifically, the question of whether we can target these precursors, the DNA and the RNA, that are required to make prion protein in the first place. Why focus on reducing PRP? It is a great unifier. It's required for all of these different types of prion disease that we hear about and talk about. It's relevant across the different disease stages that we care about, symptomatic disease, but also PRP is present in healthy people before disease. So you could think about targeting it as a preventive strategy. And in particular, when we think about targeting DNA and RNA, Proteins, so we have thousands and thousands and thousands of proteins in our bodies, these molecular machines that are designed to do really different jobs. And so they have different shapes that correspond to those jobs. When you develop a drug against a protein, for each one, you're really starting from scratch. You're asking, what is the shape? Where can I bind this particular molecule? And each one is sort of its own independent effort. Whereas when we think about DNA and RNA, Across genes, these sort of share more in terms of their structure. And that makes it just a little easier if someone has designed a technology for targeting their gene of interest to think about, can I port that technology over to my gene of interest? So it's easier to sort of share technologies and strategies across different disease targets. So as we think about how we can reduce PRP, um, sort of returning to my comments up top. Um, as you folks know, we've been collaborating with Ionis Pharmaceuticals on an antisense oligonucleotide or ASO 
that targets the PRP RNA and um, reduces its levels. And um, this has been just a really exciting collaboration over the past five to six years. And we've reached the stage now where, as some of you may have seen, um, a molecule called ION716 is actually formally listed in Ionis's pipeline um, on their website as being in development for prion disease. So we remain super enthusiastic and committed to this work. And I, I remain really hopeful that a PRP lowering ASO could be the first um, PRP lowering treatment to make it to human clinical trials. But I, I also sort of zooming out to the larger scientific question and introducing today's topic, um, wanted to sort of talk about the, the idea that there may not be, it is possible that in the long run, there could be more than one answer. Um, these sorts of therapeutic technologies, this whole area is moving fast. And there are a lot of tools even today that could theoretically reduce the amount of a single disease causing protein. This, this is sort of the key question. Which of these are tools in the lab, you know, useful tools in the lab, and which have this yet greater, more specific potential to be medicines? It is not always easy to tell those things apart. It takes a ton of work and attention to detail to actually figure out the answer to that question. Um, and some of the things we look to are, you know, data from human studies, evidence of safety. Can this thing, this tool, whatever it is, actually be delivered to the whole adult human brain, which is what we need in our disease, and it's a high bar. So um, I'll focus on just one of these technologies today, which is the focus of our CJD Foundation grant proposal, um, zinc finger proteins, or ZFPs. So you can think of a, of a zinc finger protein as sort of like a, a stop sign that you're trying to send to this gene that you wanna turn off. And you're just trying to plant that stop sign right at the beginning of the gene. So nothing can get made from it. You can't make the RNA, so you can't make the protein. That's basically the therapeutic concept. So here's already one difference from ASOs. ASOs target the prion protein RNA. Um, ZFPs go one step further upstream and actually target the gene. They target the DNA. So what are some you know, possible advantages of exploring this avenue. We think there are thousands of copies of prion protein RNA in a given cell, but um, each cell has two copies of the prion protein gene, so fewer targets. Um, if we think about dosing, ASOs based on, you know, the ASOs we see in the clinic today, um, do seem that they have to be dosed chronically every few months for neurological diseases. ZFPs offer this intriguing theoretical possibility of a one-time treatment. So here are some of the pros. Here are some of the reasons that this, this technology could be interesting to take a look at. And here are some of the other things to consider, um, ways in which maybe this technology is not yet as ready to be a medicine. Um, delivery. ASOs can go straight into spinal fluid. They have special chemical modifications that make them stable and they basically go where they need to go. That is really, really, really special and really unusual. Um, ZFPs need to be put into what we could think of as kind of a special envelope to get where they need to go. And um, that envelope is a viral vector. Um, what can we say about viral vectors? It's a very hot area of research. People are working really hard to develop better and better viral vectors that get to the cells that we want them to go to. Um, as of today, I, I would say, and I think it's, it's an interesting area of debate, but um, I would say I don't think we have the ideal viral vector to get any sort of cargo to all of the neurons in the adult human brain. So that's one drawback to consider. There's sort of like this technological piece that is really still being worked out. Now, once that envelope is discovered, would it be great to know what we want to put inside? Certainly. So I think that justifies doing some experiments now to figure out what is the ideal cargo. Um, and then there's just precedent. So has this technology in particular been turned into a medicine that has been used in the human brain um, from which we can see everything from 
you know, how well did it work for other diseases to how safe was it and how was it dosed and, and how did all these details play out in real life? For ASOs, yes, we can look to other diseases that are already in the clinic or approved drugs. Um, for ZFPs, they are not yet at that stage. So I hope this helps set up how ZFPs offer like really a really intriguing different profile and why we think they're worthy of, of exploration, although I think they are not nearly as sort of clinically ready as a technology like ASOs. So um, with all of that said, we launched this collaboration with Sangamo Therapeutics to test ZFPs in um, prion disease. And um, the first step of that was really just taking a whole bunch, about 200 ZFPs that target the prion protein gene, putting them into cells and asking, are they doing what we need them to do? So we're measuring prion protein RNA and we're asking, are those RNA levels going down in the presence of this ZFP treatment? And um, for many of these ZFPs, about a third, they were capable of reducing that prion protein RNA by more than half. So, so far, so good. Step two was to zoom in on the best ones um, in a little bit more detail. So here, this experiment was done in mouse neurons in a dish. So a little bit of a fancier system. And the eight best ZFPs went into those cells um, at six different dose levels. And here they were packaged in that special envelope. They were pa packaged in a viral vector um, that is great for mouse cells. And um, again, we were measuring prion protein RNA with the idea being if we're planting a stop sign on the DNA, then less RNA should be produced. And that is what we saw. So at the high dose um, that these cells were given, ZFPs were reducing the prion protein RNA by more than 90%. So that was exciting to see. These are the data that we have in hand today. And um, a, an experiment that was just launched two weeks ago, um, having seen those data in cells, we said, okay, it's time to go into, into mice. It's time to see how this actually performs in, in a living animal. Um, and so the six best ZFPs were packaged in a viral vector and delivered to mice. So these animals were dosed two weeks ago and in two more weeks, we're going to do the analysis to see, did we lower prion protein RNA and protein levels in the brain? So that's the next step, and hopefully we'll have data on that soon. And then what comes next? If we see that we have had the desired result, so prion protein levels are down, the next step is to go into a disease model, go into an animal that is infected with prions. Um, so. This will probably be the top two to four ZFPs would actually go into this sort of treatment study where what we're measuring is survival. It's do the treated mice live longer than the untreated mice? And that will give us, you know, yet a more sophisticated answer to the, to the overall question of, is this working? If we see good data there, the next step is gonna be to advance to ZFPs that target the human gene. And at this point, we sort of loop back through all the previous steps. Um, we go back and test in human cells, and then we go to mice that have the human prion protein gene, and we ask, are we lowering PRP? And then we ask, are the animals living longer if they're infected with prions and then get the treatment? Um, so we'll sort of measure all of the above. And that is sort of the vision for the whole project to ask, is this a promising therapeutic strategy overall? So that is kind of the arc of the project, where we are, where we hope to go with it. I think within the next month, hopefully we will have data out of that first study in mice. It may be another six months before we have data out of the first study in prion infected mice. And um, then we figure out if we loop to the next phase of doing a study with human ZFPs, um, which, which I very much hope the data will justify. Um, so, just as we sort of wrap up, um, I wanted to share some thoughts on this exciting moment in technological development where we can sort of look around and see these different emerging tools and ask, do any of these also have the future potential to be medicines? Um, I think very fortunately, um, this is an area where technology is going to keep evolving. And um, that is going to be really, I think, exciting um, change for our for our community to keep an eye on. But I want to return to something that I think we, we have learned so far 
that um, may have some, you know, lasting, enduring value. Um, what I'm showing here is one plot from, from all of the ASO studies that we've done over the past several years. And um, what you're seeing is in gray, um, mice that were infected with prions on day zero. And then you can see that about 150, a little bit more than 150 days later, um, those mice in gray that got no treatment and have the normal amount of PRP start to fall off. So they don't survive past this point. In red, in the red dashed line, what you're looking at are actually old data um, from the 1990s where uh, mice were genetically engineered to express 50% of the normal amount of prion protein. So this um, is not sort of a, a therapeutic strategy. This was sort of a, a technological manipulation that you could do in a lab, but it was done as a proof of concept to allow us to, to ask, um, is reducing prion protein levels by 50%, does it make a difference? And what we see here is, yes, it does. You infect those mice with prions, and their survival is tripled compared to those mice with the normal amount of prion protein. So superimposed over that in blue, um, what you're looking at are data from last year um, from an ASO study in which we took mice that had the normal amount of prion protein to begin with, and then we dosed them on a chronic basis, so every 90 days, with a PRP-lowering ASO to try to keep the levels of PRP consistently suppressed. And what struck me um, about these data is, is how well they sort of sit on top of the red curve. So the red curve told us, yes, theoretically, we can do this. And the blue curve now tells us, yes, we can do this with a drug. And that still gives us this benefit where we're seeing this amazing extension of survival. So this to me says a PRP lowering drug, um, you know, is is a goal to strive for. And, you know, I think our job is to get the first such drug to the clinic as fast as we possibly can, um, while also keeping one eye on the future and asking what else might it hold? Because I think this goal, this, this therapeutic hypothesis and therapeutic strategy um, is one that's gonna last. So that is what we are endeavoring to do day to day. Um, so many people to thank, and um, especially thank you so much to the families that gave these, these research grants that really have made this work possible, um, got it off the ground, and we're really excited to see where it goes. Thank you.